queens are famous. All queens are well known. All queens are loved and adored. Well, actually, that may be a lie. But there are certain queens whose name is known more across the world than others. And maybe one of the most famous of all is Queen Victoria. The Victorian era encompassed several dazzling moments, but amongst the good times were some of the darkest moments of English history. Please continue to support my channel by subscribing. Queen Victoria was the head of state and she reigned over the UK for longer than anyone before her. Her reign did not always run smoothly and she experienced scandal, tragedy and heartache. Join me today to look at 15 facts of Queen Victoria. One thing that is not very known is that Queen Victoria's name was not actually Victoria. She was born, named Alexandrina Victoria, on the 24th of May 1819. Not only was her name not Victoria, but she was also never meant to reign over the UK. She rose to the throne very quickly and unexpectedly. She was the daughter to the son of the king. She had been conceived with the whole purpose of making more heirs for the throne during a time of troubles for the government when the Princess of Wales, the next heir, died during childbirth. But no one thought his line would get anywhere near the crown. Upon her birth, Victoria was fifth in line for the throne, but the little girl was quickly baptised into tragedy. One of Queen Victoria's nicknames was the Grandmother of Europe. She gained this nickname due to her meddling in her big brood's love lives. If you were a royal in the 20th century, chances are you were related to Queen Victoria. Queen Victoria meddled in the lives of her children and grandchildren and even chose their significant others, ensuring they married into the best or worst royal families throughout the world. Unbeknown to us, of her intentions, the decision she made with matchmaking was to build a stronger Britain and better relationships with countries across the globe. However, this was not always the case and often the royals' lives would end in devastation and assassination for many of them. Although you would get a pretty glamorous wedding with opulent wealth, it would be overshadowed by the depressing lives after the wedding and it potentially led to the outbreak of World War I. As a child, Victoria saw the perishing of all of the royal heirs to the throne. Their ends were heartbreaking, and one by one they all died within a four-year period. Three of her cousins died, then her father and her grandfather passed within a week of each other. At just 11 years old in 1830, Victoria became next in line for the throne and more misfortune was just around the corner. Victoria called her childhood melancholy, but it was even darker than that. The famous stories of how Queen Victoria was brought up as a child are no myth, and the Duchess of Kent, who was used to getting her own way, controlled every little aspect of her life. This was when the famous Kensington system was born, and the bitter relationship between Victoria and her mother began. The Kensington system was designed to keep the young Victoria as far away from everyone as possible. The Duchess forced the girl to sleep with her every night, refused her nearly all playmates except for the family dog, and put her under a strict tutoring regime to turn her into the perfect ruler. And she also kept the girl away from King William's side of the family. She did not do this alone. She had a partner in crime who would become one of the most hated men of Queen Victoria upon her reign. Duchess Victoria and her beloved partner John Conroy also had a huge hand in building it. Conroy took on the system as his own showing even more devotion to it than the Duchess herself. Queen Victoria was also a short woman. She grew to a mere four foot eleven. She was a strong queen who played a massive part in ensuring the development of the free world. However, below these accolades stood a tiny queen. The queen's height concerned some of her family, 
as they thought her short stature would harm her in the public eye in a future life. Victoria's uncle, then King William, absolutely despised her mother. When Parliament decided that the Duchess could be Victoria's regent, William's response was unforgettably petty. The Duchess didn't like being in close proximity to King William IV, but the monarch had noticed how she was manipulating the young Victoria for her own gain, and he was not happy. In his way to approach the topic, he did so dramatically, when on his 71st birthday banquet in 1836, William silenced the room and uttered a shocking speech. At the banquet in front of many luminaries, he began his announcement with a promise to living for nine months longer, so that little Victoria would turn 18 under his rule and deny her mother the regency. He was absolutely not willing to give one inch of power to this cretting of a woman, and he made everybody aware. This led to the public humiliation of the Duchess, continuing his speech with, if I lived to the girl's birthday, I should then have the satisfaction of leaving the exercise of the royal authority to the personal authority of that young lady, heiress presumptive to the crown, and not in the hands of a person now near me, who is herself incompetent to act with propriety in the situation. Many historians attribute the stereotypical morality of the Victorian era to Victoria's mother, and the Duchess was obsessed with keeping Victoria pure. Since King William had illegitimate children, the Duchess thought he was an oversexed oaf and even denied the King of England the opportunity to see his niece. Life as the heir to the British throne isn't all luxury and gallantry. In order to sell Victoria as the next monarch, Conroy and the Duchess forced the princess to attend a gruelling tour of England visiting town after town to drum up support for her coronation. They worked a treat, and the crowds quickly fell in love with the young girl, but this came at a heartbreakingly high cost. The tour was a success, but it left Victoria feeling hateful and fatigued, with the constant travelling before she ultimately begged her mother to stop the tour. In October 1835, in the middle of one of those tours, Victoria took ill with an intense fever. Unsurprisingly, her mother used the opportunity to push her own gross agenda. In October 1835, the exhausted 16-year-old girl fell ill. Her mother and Conroy had little sympathy for the girl, instead believing she was faking it. She was getting more and more ill, and in her weakened, vulnerable state, her mother tried to get her to sign over the role of private secretary to the man who had tormented her for years under the strict Kensington system. Luckily, it didn't work. Even in her poorly state, she did not trust this man. When she was 16 years old and becoming of age, Victoria's family started making plans to marry her off. She was the most eligible bride of the time, and there were two men in the running, Prince Alexandra of the Netherlands, who King William IV backed, and Prince Albert, who her maternal uncle, King Leopold I of Belgium, supported. But when Victoria saw Albert this time, she got a great feeling from him. Victoria was smitten with Albert, and her private diaries go into very personal detail. The future monarch was a love-struck teenager, Writing that Albert was extremely handsome, his eyes are large and blue, and he has a beautiful nose and a very sweet mouth. She described Prince Alexander as very plain. Victoria and Albert may have bonded through shared family trauma. Albert had his own childhood trauma. His mother was estranged due to his horrible father, who spread rumours that she had affairs during their marriage. His parents would divorce and his mother started an illicit affair while his father married his own niece. There is a rumour that has spread for decades that Queen Victoria was known for a very famous saying, We are not amused. Despite this being denied, the rumour still circulates today. 
Many servants reported that the Queen was often immensely amused and roared with laughter. In the end, King William held on to his promise to stay alive long enough to stop the Queen Victoria's mother from becoming regent. When Victoria turned 18 in May 1837, he was still alive. He passed away less than a month later, turning little Victoria into Queen of the United Kingdom. Victoria found out the news while she was still in her dressing gown. She had a very famous father figure. When Victoria began her reign, she was naive and eager for any help. She discovered the help she desired in the Whig Prime Minister, Lord Melbourne. He took the inexperienced Queen under his wing. This man was childless and had enough time for Victoria. He saw her almost as an adoptive daughter. Victoria was scandalised when she noticed that when British lawyers wore their silk stockings, she could still see their leg hair sticking out of the tights. In response, she imposed a royal dress code. All barristers had to double layer their stockings. Queen Victoria banished her mother, despite many people believing that she would live with her, due to being unmarried and young. But Queen Victoria had seen her mother for who she was, and her controlling ways were brought to light. This influenced Queen Victoria's decision to relegate her to the old derelict areas of Buckingham Palace that she rarely ever visited, in a bid to avoid her mother altogether. Queen Victoria was one of the most eligible brides of the time, but despite this, she was not keen on getting married just yet. She wanted to have some time to herself, although many believed that she was instantly smitten with Prince Albert. That was not the case. The then Prime Minister Melbourne suggested that Victoria get married in order to avoid her mother's controlling grasp, and Victoria was not initially keen and saw it as a shocking alternative. Victoria was the Queen, and therefore it was her duty to propose to her future husband, which by today's standards was far from traditional for ordinary folk. On an autumn day in October of 1839, Prince Albert arrived in England for his second visit, whereby he was to fully win over his bride, and on the 15th of the month, Queen Victoria proposed to Prince Albert. Queen Victoria was notorious for writing many, many journal entries of her everyday life, and her wedding night was no exception. She wrote fondly and enthusiastically about how amazing her night was with the prince, exclaiming that their union was, I never, never spent such an evening, my dearest, dearest, dear Albert. He clasped me in his arms and we kissed each other again and again. She was falling in love with the prince and her love only grew from then onwards. It didn't take long, much to her disgust to fall pregnant. She had wanted to hold off having children while she settled into newly married life with her Prince Charming. Unfortunately for her, those steamy nights she spent journaling about had created new life and she fell pregnant very quickly. Victoria discovered she was pregnant only weeks after her wedding. The only 20-something newly crowned queen was furious and filled with disappointment. Despite this being the very thing she was expected to do, bring an heir into the world to take over the throne in her absence. She wrote to her grandmother, It is spoiling my happiness. I have always hated the idea, and I prayed God night and day for me to be left free for at least six months. Not only was she disappointed in being pregnant, she wanted to be pregnant with a boy if she was going to be pregnant at all. She wrote to her grandmother that if she ended up having a nasty girl, she would drown the babe. Despite not being a fan of pregnancy, Victoria and Albert would go on to make an almighty, impressive brood of children. They produced nine children in total. They were Victoria, Albert, Alice, Alfred, Helena, Louise, Arthur, Leopold and Beatrice. All of these children survived into adulthood. This was a huge achievement for the time. Queen Victoria also survived despite the huge risks with pregnancy and childbirth during those days. 
She created a large brood of children and hated their pregnancies, so it is no surprise that she didn't make the greatest mother on earth. She also did not enjoy bringing up children. She was utterly miserable with the task at hand. She believed that newborn babies were ugly and she didn't breastfeed any of them. She even became very averse to breastfeeding babies for all women, even going as far as to condemn her own daughters who wished to breastfeed their children. One of the reasons she may have hated pregnancy so much may have been because she suffered severely from postpartum depression, once calling pregnancy the heaviest trial I have ever had to endure. Prince Albert was in a huge power struggle with his wife, who was becoming more and more confident with her new role as queen. She had become accustomed to her newfound power as queen, and Albert was becoming jealous of her domineering behaviour, and she was determined to keep every ounce of power for herself, often refusing to let Albert take over her duties even when she was pregnant. It didn't take long for Albert to feel like he didn't belong, once confessing that the difficulty in filling my place with the proper dignity is that I am only the husband, not the master in the house. Victoria probably hoped that he would get used to his place in the family eventually, but she was sorely mistaken, especially because he had someone around his house that he despised. Victoria's old childhood governess, Baroness Lezen, was in charge of running the household that he so wished to run himself, and this led to him despising her. He took to calling her names in retaliation, dubbing her the House Dragon as well as he outright refused to communicate with her before he tried to push her out of the house by accusing her of putting his children in danger. He tried to use his position as Victoria's husband to remove her from the household and he furiously demanded that Queen Victoria kick the woman out. He was left waiting for her final decision on the matter and it was not what he expected. His wife did not pander to his strops and outbursts and she refused to ever back down, which often led to extremely heated arguments. But at this point, Victoria realised that her husband was feeling demasculated and insecure, and at this point he needed just a wife, not a queen, and so she eventually agreed to send Lezen off packing. But this was not the only problem that Albert had to deal with. The pair were still newly married, Victoria was pregnant, and the pair were travelling by horse and carriage, when out of nowhere, the deranged Edward Oxford jumped out of the crowd with a loaded pistol and shot at the royal couple, with the intention of killing the Queen. The pair were unharmed despite the horses being dumbfounded and rearing off its speed. This would not be the only attempt on her life. Victoria survived an impressive six assassination attempts, the second happened in 1842, and she was pretty blasé about it. In May that year, John Francis aimed a pistol at her while she was driving along the Mall in London, though his gun failed and he ran away. Unfazed, Victoria came up with an ingenuous plan. The next day, Queen Victoria took the same route again, Albert with a bigger escort as a ploy to draw out her assailant once more. Francis took it hook, line and sinker. He shot at her again and was immediately taken in by the authorities. The eighth child and second youngest heir of the reigning Queen Victoria and her husband, Prince Albert, little Leopold, came into the world as something of a medical marvel. Queen Victoria had given birth eight times and she was controversially used chloroform as a form of pain relief, which went against the status quo of the public at the time. It was the Christian belief at the time that women were supposed to suffer in childbirth and if they were interrupted this natural way of things, there might be divine consequences. She was so pleased with the effects of chloroform that she used it again when she gave birth to the baby of the family her daughter Beatrice. Victoria ruled for 63 years, an overwhelming span of time 
that only her great-great-granddaughter, Queen Elizabeth II, surpassed. Join me in part three to delve into more dramas in Queen Victoria's life, including the fallouts with her husband and children, and how she meddled in their lives, as well as how the tragedy of her husband's death took its toll on her. There was a secret reason, perhaps, that Queen Victoria hated pregnancy. Her diaries reveal that she may have been on some level experiencing postpartum depression. In a missive to her uncle, she called her second pregnancy the heaviest trial I have ever had to endure. Victoria was obviously, as most women are, scared of childbirth, and it was still not the safest undertaking of a woman and the strain that it put on her body. Albert, but anything but empathetic, he was annoyed and impatient. He complained about her moods and her lack of self-control, sneering at her crying over a miserable trifle. Queen Victoria wore a white wedding dress, which started the fashion for weddings for years to come. This was very unusual. Most brides wore colour on their big day, but as the Queen was wearing white, this started a new trend which is still traditional today. The prior concerns of royal madness came to fruition when she began to experience hallucinations, further linking her to mad King George III. Her hallucinations were reported to have been her seeing spots on people's eyes that would suddenly transform into worms, and soon she feared she was losing her mind. Prince Albert had to take Victoria to Scotland to recover. Albert's response to all of this was brutal, and he was not the most supportive. Perhaps her aversion to pregnancies and her children in general led her to feel she loved her husband more than them. She was unduly devoted to him, and in 1856, while Albert was away on a trip, the unhappy Queen wrote, All the numerous children are as nothing to me when he is away. The relationships with her children would remain turbulent even in their adulthood, but she was able to use them to her advantage. Her favourite child and youngest, Princess Beatrice, was the baby of the family, but her role as the favourite child came with the chilling obligations. Victoria did not want Beatrice to marry. She instead insisted that her daughter devote her life to taking care of her. However, Beatrice, as she grew older, would go against this wish from her mother in the ultimate betrayal. Prince Albert was one of a kind. He was brilliant with the children, which was very different for the times. Most men would leave child-rearing to the mothers and nannies, but he took a keen interest in his children's lives. He was most importantly interested in their education, and he introduced a rigorous education system for them all to follow. He was also present for all of their births, which was a strange for the times. Childbirth was seen as just a woman's occasion. He would also play games with the children as they grew up, but he was not always the warm and cuddly dad. He was also keen on corporal punishment. Her favourite child, Beatrice, betrayed her and went against her wishes when, at a wedding, the groom's brother caught her eye. She spent the wedding day with Prince Henry of Battenberg and they enjoyed each other's company, talking, dancing and sharing flirtatious romance. Beatrice returned home and told her mother she was to wed Prince Henry. Queen Victoria was in charge of the matchmaking between the members of the family and her permission was required for a marriage to go ahead. Beatrice was over succumbing to her mother's demands, and she no longer cared for her opinion on the matter. The Queen's response for the Princess's rude approach to her match was to famously ignore her. Victoria was devastated at the prospect of her youngest child leaving her. She retaliated with cold and cruel silence, and refused to respond. She ignored Beatrice for seven months, only writing notes to her if she needed to communicate something. A year and a half after the princess had announced her engagement to Prince Henry, the Queen finally agreed to speak to her daughter face to face, but she was armed with a selfish ultimatum. Victoria was incessant on not giving up on her child living with her, 
and she very selfishly demanded that if Beatrice wished to marry her Prince Charming, that the newly married pair would move in with her after the wedding. All of this was nothing compared to what Queen Victoria did to her least favourite child. A dark secret clouded the royal family whereby the males born to the many match-made couples that descended from Queen Victoria would suffer from a genetic disease called haemophilia, which prevents blood from clotting properly. Victoria had passed this on to her son and suddenly the prince's dangerous falls and sickly disposition made all too much sense. Unfortunately for little Prince Leopold, the dangerous impacts of haemophilia manifested in men, not women, and it was soon very clear that the princeling was in fatal danger at all moments of the day. Victoria worried constantly about his internal bleeding, and nobody believed that he would survive into adulthood. It led to every mother's worst nightmare. Leopold died at the tender age of 30 after a cerebral haemorrhage. The mystery of where this disease came from fueled rumours that Queen Victoria was a love child, as no one before her had it. This is where the rumour that the Duchess of Kent had an affair and that Queen Victoria was the love child with that mystery man. And there is one more piece of evidence for this theory. Another royal disease was porphyria. This has been prevalent in her ancestors, especially in her grandfather, Mad King George III. This disease failed to be passed on after Victoria, but haemophilia rose instead. Did the Duchess portray a legitimate heir of England, or was she the product of a steamy affair? It is unlikely that a carrier of the haemophiliac was the Duchess's lover, as he wouldn't have lived long enough into adulthood before he died. It is a possibility that the Duchess was the one who passed this fatal disease on to her daughter, since it is a random mutation in 30% of cases. Queen Victoria always wore her emotions on her sleeve, and she was easy to offend as well as disappoint. Her displeasure was evident with the Liberal Prime Minister, William Gladstone, who displeased her incessantly. Victoria called him half crazy and a ridiculous old man, while she disparaged his government as being the worst I have ever had. Join me in part four to delve into some very strange facts on Queen Victoria, the strange gift Prince Albert bought her and her further disapproval of Prime Ministers, as well as her own son. If Beatrice was Queen Victoria's favourite, Prince Albert's beloved child was their firstborn, Vicky, who he praised as being very intelligent and observant. Prince Albert and the family lovingly called her Vicky for the rest of her life. He made Queen Victoria a brooch out of his favourite child's baby teeth, which may have been one step too far towards creepy. One of Victoria's biggest scandals was in 1839, often referred to as the Bedchamber Crisis. The Whig Prime Minister resigned that year, and Victoria begrudgingly invited Conservative leader Robert Peel to form a minority government. But there was a catch. Victoria had to fire her beloved ladies-in-waiting, who were married to Whigs, and hire Conservative women in their place. This is where Victoria reacted badly and offended the Prime Minister. Victoria would not fire her ladies-in-waiting, and this caused huge disappointment, and Peel was so offended by her rebellion that he declined the position. He would go on to have the best revenge when, in 1841, he was able to get a majority government. The Queen was eventually obliged to tiptoe around the party line and boot out her Whig ladies. Victoria was an absent monarch for the large part of her reign, and in more ways than one. The death of her husband made her a recluse, but as well as this, she never visited the country of India, despite being their empress. Although she was very close friends with an Indian servant called Abdul Karim later in life, it didn't take long for him to be promoted to her personal clerk and closest confidant. 
Victoria's family were extremely disappointed. They believed that this man was using her for his own gain. And it was this belief that led them to completely betray him upon her death by deporting him back to India. The six attempts on her life was very nearly successful when she was injured receiving a flesh wound. The mentally ill officer, Robert Pate, was able to get close enough to her royal carriage to hit her with his cane, crushing her bonnet and giving her a light forehead bruise. Victoria responded, chump change. She was not everybody's favourite monarch, and she even gained the name, the Famine Queen, by the Irish, despite putting forward a large financial donation of six and a half million pounds towards the fund to help with the potato famine in Ireland. They claimed that her help was not enough to help them. And the monarch was also at the forefront of new technology and lots of new gadgets were produced during the Victorian era. She was one of the first British monarchs to travel by train. She even got her own royal train with the world's first onboard bathroom. And she was also a traveller. Despite being so close, Spain was not a country that had been visited by a British monarch before her in 1889. Although her visit was only a short-lived one, when she briefly crossed the border into Spain while travelling the south of France. Queen Elizabeth II is not the only monarch to have love for animals. Queen Victoria also had her own soft spot for pups too. As one of Victoria's very last wishes, attendants bought her favourite Pomeranian Churi to her deathbed to keep her company. Victoria had wanted an heir to her throne in the form of a male, and her wish was granted with her son Albert, but the relationship would be turbulent throughout the years. He was her greatest disappointment due to his lack of interest in his education, as well as his embarrassing extracurricular activities with many women of the night. To top off her dislike for her son, things only got worse when she blamed him wholeheartedly for the death of her husband. After a short stint as a military officer, Bertie disappointed both of his parents when he decided to hook up with an actress called Nellie Clifton, sparking major interest in his love life by the public. Prince Albert took it upon himself to try to put a stop to his affair by travelling to Cambridge where Bertie was studying to confront him. However, this did nothing to deter his son, but it did instead lead to tragedy. Prince Albert had long suffered from many health issues and upon his return from travelling to chastise Bertie, his health deteriorated. His chronic stomach pains, most people now believe that he was suffering from Crohn's, became fatal and he passed just weeks after the confrontation on the 14th of December 1861. Queen Victoria blamed Prince Albert's demise almost entirely on her son Bertie once even writing, Oh, that boy, I can never can or shall look at him without a shudder. It is reported that she never forgave him, and she took revenge on him over the years by denying him access to any of his birthrights to the throne. She refused to allow him to see any official documents, as well as denying him any political power or position, until the very day that she died and he became king. To say Queen Victoria took Albert's death badly is an understatement. Apart from accusing and almost disowning her son Bertie, she fell into a deep depression and she spent the rest of her life mourning, wearing black. She also made her surviving family members undertake an extensive period of mourning of many years, refusing them the joy of even their own weddings. This last habit earned her the mournful nickname, the Widow of Windsor. Victoria took the news of Albert's death very badly and she withdrew from life and remained in mourning until she died. Not only did she basically disown her son, she became a depressed version of herself which branded her the nickname the Widow of Windsor. Her private habits were nothing short of bizarre and in the many long years after Albert's passing, Victoria insisted that her servants keep his rooms continually prepared as if he was just going to walk through the door one day. 
The servants always made up a bowl of hot water for him to shave with, as well as laying out new clothes for him to wear. Overcome with grief, Victoria retreated from public life. Eventually, she refused to perform all but her most essential royal duties, and the British people definitely took notice. A protester even pinned a cruel notice at Buckingham Palace that read, These commanding premises to be let or sold in a consequence of the late occupant's declining business. By January 1901, Victoria's other son, Alfred, had passed, and the Queen felt her own end coming too. She suffered from rheumatism and had nearly gone blind from cataracts. On January the 22nd, the great Queen Victoria finally died at the ripe old age of 81, and at the eminently sensible time of 6.30pm. Vicky wouldn't have it any other way. Please continue to support my channel by subscribing. Please comment, like and subscribe if you wish for more stories and leave your suggestions below and I will endeavour to cover them.